Hello guys and welcome. Today we're going to be taking a look at an old rusty computer. This was being given away about six years ago and when I went to go pick it up, the owner's house smelled like foul cigarette smoke and sadly the computer did as well. Luckily, after leaving it sitting around for a few years, it doesn't smell like cigarette smoke anymore. So, let's power it up and see just what we can do with it. As we press the power button, the machine springs into life. It appears as the machine has a 233 MHz AMD K6 processor. The fans are also quite loud. It seems to be booting into Windows ME otherwise known as Millennium Edition. This OS came out about a year before Windows XP. That boot chime is rather unfamiliar to me as I don't believe I've ever actually owned a Windows ME computer before. It also seems as if the previous owner was a fan of Shrek. There's something we have in common. Detected are two optical drives, floppy and one hard disk with a size of approximately 3 gigabytes. We can confirm that this system is indeed detecting 128 megabytes of RAM, which is plenty for this system. The 233 megahertz processor on the other hand is below the recommended CPU speed of 300 megahertz for running Windows ME. The 2D graphics card here is an S3 Verge DX 4 megabyte card while it appears as a 3D accelerator card is also installed. Digging a little further reveals this machine is rocking a 3DFX Voodoo 2 card, more specifically an 8 megabyte variant. A small pass-through VGA cable is required to connect both cards. I tried just using a standard length VGA cable to bridge between them, with less than ideal results. To solve the problem I used two Apple DB15 to VGA adapters which worked surprisingly well. Another interesting fact is that the 8MB Voodoo 2 card sells for well over $100 on eBay. Taking a look around the system, there aren't all that many programs installed. However, there is Space Cadet Pinball. I used to spend hours as a kid playing this game. Now that we know that this system still works and has a decent 3D graphics accelerator, let's install some fun old games and see just what this rusty old computer is capable of. Later in the video we will be taking this computer apart as well as cleaning it up, but just in case it dies during surgery we're going to do most of the testing now. Since the USB ports don't seem to work and the CD drive is really the only way to get big files onto it, I burnt a few of my favourite games to a CD. A lot of these games are abandoned where and can be found easily online. I ended up deleting a lot of unnecessary files as there was only about 1GB of free drive space to work with. First of all we're going to try Hover, a simple 3D game that was included on the Windows 95 install disk. The aim of the game is to find all of your opponent's flags before they find all of yours. This, unsurprisingly, works great. Age of Empires 2 is very playable at the resolution of 800x600. I'm aware that the 4x3 image is being stretched to fit the 16x9 display, however I don't actually have a 4x3 VGA LCD monitor in my possession at the moment. Next up we have Duke Nukem 3D in all of its 3D accelerated glory. The game also runs very fluidly. Thankfully this system is compatible with the sound and music. The Glide API is compatible with Quake 2. It runs very well on this system, even at 640x480 high settings. The frame rate is pretty smooth throughout. Motocross Madness 2 with the settings on low is definitely playable and a whole lot of fun. This is however pushing what this system is capable of. Another game that takes advantage of the 3D effects Voodoo 2 is Need for Speed SE2.
This is very impressive graphically and the frame rate is solid. Monster Truck Madness 2 has been a favourite of mine for many years. This game also uses the Voodoo 2 3D Accelerator. And at 640x480 normal image quality, it is very playable. Last of all, we're trying out the most graphically demanding game of the lot, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2. Sadly, as much as I love the soundtrack to this game, I don't want the video to be copyright claims, so I turned it off. Running at 640x480 normal settings was a little bit choppy, but for the most part responsive and fun to play. Now it's time to shut it down and begin the refurbishment. I began by removing all of the PCI cards. Aside from minor pitting on the metal backplate, the Voodoo 2 card is in pretty good condition. It looks as if the S3 Verge card can actually have more VRAM added. I also made note of where all the connectors plug in on the logic board. The mess of IDE cables were next to come out. Several screws held the logic board in place. With a bit of careful manoeuvring I got it out. It's not often you see a motherboard capable of using two different types of RAM. Also, all of the capacitors look to be in good shape. All of the drives are held in place with Phillips head screws. The optical drives slid out through the front. Honestly, I could probably just only put one of them back in, but I don't have any spare five and a quarter inch drive covers. The rusty power supply was held in place by four Phillips head screws. I totally just put in a different one. However, I don't have any more power supplies with the physical power switch anymore. To remove the power supply completely, I had to remove the front plate of the PC. Now the power switch can be unscrewed. I also removed the remaining parallel and COM ports that were attached to the case. With the case stripped down completely, I began with wiping it down using some eucalyptus oil. With a damp cloth, I went over all the tarnished areas. Some sticker residue on the casing was also removed. Years of gunk and debris had accumulated on this case and many of its components. The plastic cover over the front display had started to come off. Using a dab of super glue, I got it back on. I actually just noticed how warped the RAM dims are. In fact, I'm pretty sure only one of the sticks is actually making contact properly. Removing all three sticks reveals a total of 512 megabytes of 133 MHz SD RAM. The CPU heatsink can now be removed, revealing the Socket 7 AMD K62 processor. The hard disk only needed a light wipe down with some methylated spirits. We can see that this is a cool old school Seagate ST33232A 3.2GB hard disk. The back of the drive also looks pretty neat. The floppy drive has a manufacture date of the 6th of July 1995. Over time this computer was clearly upgraded with more modern hardware. The most obvious change is the fact someone drilled out space for a PS2 connector on the new logic board. I do believe this CD-ROM drive here is the original one, as it dates back to 1995. The power supply is rated at 200 watts, and from what I can tell, manufactured in April of 1998 according to the markings on the top. Inside we can see that this is quite a cheap looking power supply. Caution must definitely be taken when handling the internals, as the amperages stored in the capacitors can be lethal. The next morning I took the case outside and sanded back the rust. Using a silver paint marker I covered any problem areas. With most of the rear casing sanded back, I cleaned off the surface, then applied a few coats of silver spray paint. I did actually forget to remove one sticker and ended up just painting over it. I blew out the loose dust from within the power supply. All of the components were held in place by small Phillips head screws. Parts of the PCB had broken away at the mounting screws. I gave the exhaust fan a much needed dusting. After sanding back the rusted exhaust fan, I painted over the rust several times with a paint pen. The paint should act as a barrier, stopping the rust from oxidizing further. Spraying from different angles, I was able to get an even coat applied. I did contemplate trying to bleach the yellowed plastic. 
However, after cleaning it, it wasn't all that yellow. I did, however, scrub the surface with 6% hydrogen peroxide to remove any grubbiness left on the front panel. Using a brush, I did clean up the heatsink. Using some super glue, I attached the broken pieces of the power supply's PCB. With great care not to electrocute myself, I reassembled it. There we have it, the final result. Not too shabby if I do say so myself. With the logic board dusted off, I began refitting the CPU. I chose to just use the thermal pad that was already installed on the heatsink. Here's where we ran into our first major hurdle. The RAM would absolutely not fit back into their slots. Since the RAM dims were already warped, I thought I'll try straightening them out by clamping down the ends and applying some super glue, using heat to make the glue dry faster. The RAM dims were now definitely less bent, but I really struggled to get any sticks to sit in properly. Eventually I got one of the sticks to mostly fit in. While definitely not ideal, I used rubber bands to hold the clips in place. Thankfully that one stick did appear to actually make contact. The tower could now be put back together. I paid close attention to make sure I put everything back in the correct order. The logic board slotted back into place nicely. I also ended up spray painting a few of the backplates for some of the PCI cards as well. I chose to keep the graphics cards as original as possible as modifying them would likely decrease their value. Just to test, I plugged the system in to see if it would still turn on. With great excitement, I was pleased to see that it still powered up. Now, the rest of the drives could be installed. I actually thought I'd try my own recipe for bleaching plastic with the top CD drive. I was quite surprised and it worked very effectively. Sadly, the drive tray cover flipped upside down as the container sat out in the sun, and I wasn't able to get it looking as white. The amount of cloud cover also didn't help. Overall, that drive definitely looks somewhat better. But honestly, the computer really isn't that yellowed and it doesn't bother me. So, does the system still work? Thankfully, yes. Although it is still only showing up with 128 megabytes of RAM, even though we put in a single 256 megabyte piece of RAM. I really do have a soft spot for mid to late 90s desktop computers. There are just so many fun games and things you can do on them. The difference is truly night and day. I tried my best at cable management, however there really isn't a whole lot you can do. Also, with the logic board in this system, the turbo button has no functionality, but it does look cool. It really puts a smile on my face when I bring new life into old dilapidated systems. With all the work done, I should be able to enjoy using this system for many years to come. Thank you very much for watching. This video definitely took a lot of time to make, and if you've enjoyed, feel free to leave a like, and if you want to see more, subscribing is definitely appreciated. Thank you very much, I'll see you in the next video.